Welcome to this episode of the AEC Engineering and Technology Podcast, a podcast dedicated to helping engineering professionals find technology that fits their needs. In this episode, I'll be talking with Todd Kirkham, founder and CEO of Iron Tech Security, about how AEC firms can and should protect themselves from cyber attacks and what engineering firms should do right away when they realize they have been hacked. Tom was also previously seen on episode 273 of the Engineering Career Coach Podcast. Let's jump in to today's episode. Thanks, Nick. Anthony Fasano here, founder of EMI. And today, I'm giving a huge thank you to our sponsor, Dell Tech. Looking for an easy solution to improve productivity and increase profitability? Check out Dell Tech Vantage Point. This key solution to proactively managing and delivering successful projects gives your team the visibility they need to create accurate and detailed project plans and confirms you're fully optimizing your resource utilization with the right people on the right projects. With dashboard views built for how you do business, you'll keep budgets on schedule and on track, ensuring successful project delivery. Hear more about Dell Tech on April 12th in our webinar, Ensuring Profitability with Proactive Project Management at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Details at engineeringmanagementinstitute.org. Okay, welcome everyone. It's now time for our conversation of the week with Tom Kirkham, founder and CEO of Iron Tech Security. Tom, welcome. Oh, it's great to be here, Nick. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing swell. How about yourself? Good, good. All right. So Tom, kind of as we were we were talking about just before this, you're you're a unique guest on the show here because most of our guests have kind of dealt on the operation side of things, right? Like how do I do an engineering task or an architecture task or a construction task better, right? So you're kind of in this unique position because what you do isn't directly involved in like the operations of an AEC firm, but what you do is critical to the success of any firm, right? Absolutely. Uh, you know, cybersecurity, m there's a lot of issues with it that the vast majority of people don't understand, especially AEC firms and attorneys and lots of other market sectors that we we uh, specialize in. Uh, but what you really need to know is between 40 to 60 percent of businesses that have a successful data breach or security event will be out of business between six months to two years. And so when you invest in cybersecurity, if you're truly doing it, uh, you, you know, you're, you're doing it to prepare against the worst possible thing that can happen. Similar to insurance, but insurance is after the fact. You know, we want to make sure that it never happens. In fact, it should be up it, the investment in cybersecurity. If the if you've got the right company and the right protection in place, uh, hopefully, it'll always be an expense. You know, exactly, so. and and an expense well worth being paid. So, Tom, can you then? Segwaying into kind of what you do on a daily basis in your firm, can you just describe a little bit about like what you're doing on a day to day basis and kind of the kind of the idea behind what your firm does? Right. We are what's known as a managed security services provider. Some of you may have a managed services provider. You outsource your IT and for probably a flat rate every month, they do help desk and they proactively manage your equipment and network devices and all of these different things. And that's a great way to do your IT, you know, and, and I'm agnostic whether it's on staff or outsourced. Uh, we're seeing more and more getting outsourced all the night, all the time. In fact, we've got a large, a rather large client that has a CIO, but he's outsourcing everything else. So he's in charge of managing outsource companies. Um, but um, the um, being a managed security services provider, what that means is, is yes, we're going to implement the proper enterprise grade, best in class administrative controls, technical controls and physical controls. But perhaps most importantly, you have skilled security teams monitoring and responding and and mitigating security anomalies or security events or something that just doesn't smell right. And if you don't prepare and already and you're not already engaged with the security team and something does happen, it's much harder and much more expensive 
to respond to a threat. The automated tools, no matter how good they are, they do not work 100%. Nothing works 100%. So our goal is to take you know, the clients that they see this leadership decision that a fatal blow or a very expensive financial blow to the company could cause. And uh, our responsibility is to make sure that that doesn't happen. And we're there, you know, as a team. And our team is backed up by hundreds of other InfoSec. That's what we call it in the business, information security, InfoSec professionals all over the world. And it's surprisingly affordable. Yes, it's not as cheap as the latest McAfee internet protection suite, but you've got real live human beings there. That's former NSA employees, DOD, Cyber Command. I mean, we, we're backed up by truly professional security people. And Tom, what I'm hearing is to make the analogy back to, let's say, civil engineering, right? It's all about preventative maintenance because you're coming in and your business proposition is, hey, let's handle this issue before it even happens. And by spending those resources and time up front, you're mitigating what could be something a lot more costly down the road. Right. Yeah. Taking the the catastrophic security incident that puts you out of business. Okay. Let's take that off the table. Research says that um, it, it the uh, being proactive about cybersecurity is four to five times cheaper than responding to a single security event, you know, an actual ransomware attack. And, and the, the, the problem is, is about half the people out there don't know where to go to get this level of protection. So part of my job is to educate everyone saying, yes, you need a managed security services provider. It's a consultative uh, risk analysis and deployment and coaching and getting all the right tools in place that we know to put on there, according to international standards. You know, you guys are all familiar with ISO and many, many other regulations and compliance. And I suspect that many of you, if not most of you, are probably under some sort of cybersecurity compliance regulations. And if you're not, you will be. We're seeing a dramatic es escalation in all sorts of industries that are now being required to get this enterprise grade cybersecurity in place and become compliant. So then let's, let's switch gears a little bit from kind of the general to the specific, right? For the audience of, of this show, how vulnerable are AEC firms really to cyber attacks, right? And what differences are you seeing in those types of employees that would be part of an AEC, AEC firm or similar firms to other clients that you're dealing with? Um, I, the good news is, is that some of our other industries that work in, uh, that we work with, uh, the, the, they see the vision and they see the threat. They weren't aware of it before, you know, they sat through an hour long continuing education class and they go, holy cow. So they grok it real fast. Right. And, th and that's the good thing about engineering firms is, is, is if they don't have the proper stuff in place, they've never been exposed to the information that I uh, that I give out during the educational webinars. Um, they just don't know what they don't know. Right. But when you look at the sheer target, many of you, if not most of you are dealing with critical infrastructure that makes you a threat vector to your client. It makes you a, uh, a, a target. And then you've got to worry about nation state level things, Right. You know, you got different types of threat actors. You got the criminal hackers that's in it just for the money. You've got nation states, China, North Korea, Russia, the list goes on, Iran. The list goes on and on, and they have their different reasons and objectives. And there, there's some other groups too, but those are the two big ones you really have to worry about. Well, if you do anything with critical infrastructure, um, especially if you're dealing with intellectual property, you know, China, it's got to be put on the list. It's got to be put on that risk assessment. So how do we defend against Chinese hackers? So there's a lot of, there's, everyone has a little bit of a different risk profile. Uh, but it's, it's really the big challenge for me, because I do this all the time, is, is getting people to see the big picture. Some people even doubt, or they 
claim that I'm exaggerating, but when you realize there's literally tens of thousands of people all over the world that are making billions and billions and billions of dollars off of criminal hacking activity, uh, the light bulbs start going off. And wow, this is done at scale. It's automatic. You know, if if your firm has been hit with a ten thousand dollar ransom, uh, that was fully automated from beginning to end. They don't know who you are. They don't care who you are. They think in terms of conversion rates of victims. So you probably got caught up in say a hundred thousand uh, phishing email campaign. And let's say the average ransom collected was $10,000. Well, if only 1% becomes victims, that's a $10 million payday for one single ransomware attack that's automated from beginning to end, the whole thing. And just remember, that's happening thousands and thousands of times a day, not to mention all the other technical threats and you know, differing objectives. I'm surprised the Ukrainian situation hasn't affected us more than what it has. I've been worried about a major cyber attack on NATO or the United States uh, ever since it began, even before it began. Um, so don't think it can happen to you if you're in that boat, because the majority of them are done at scale, automatic, don't know who you are, don't care who you are. They just want the money. And we had this conversation earlier, Tom, right? Because that's one of the most dangerous things you can do is assume, yeah, that's going to happen to somebody else, but not me. Yeah. You know, hoping it doesn't happen to you or thinking it doesn't happen to you is not a leadership strategy. That, that, that's the simple, that's it right there in a nutshell. nutshell. So uh, don't think it can happen to you. It happened. I, I wish I had a list of all the clients that finally, after the second or third ransomware attack, they said, okay, I'm going to have to get some defense in here. And it's, and, and it's similar to what we see because, you know, an asset owner, right, might have issues with their asset, but it may only be after a client complains or a board member complains, right, that they're finally going out to seek help. And, you know, moving from, let's say, like leadership decisions, executives, right, companies making decisions, what can individual employees do to help protect um, their firms against these types of attacks? The first thing is to understand that 95% of successful attacks, there was human failure in the firm. They were fooled into opening a file attachment. I want, you to, I want to say that again. 95% human failure is the weakest link. These, these criminals and even the nation state actors are using psychological manipulation, social engineering, but it's really just a con job. But instead of it being a one-on-one -on -one street con, it's a one-to-many, highly automated. They use these psychological manipulation techniques, and if you're one of those that think you're too smart to fall for it, know this. We test everyone in our organization, including myself, which don't exempt yourself if you're the leader, every week we simulate phishing attacks on our company. And there's only one person in our company that has 100% success rate, and it's not me. It can happen to anyone, even the best InfoSec professionals. I was at a, a, a conference, and the FBI agent was talking about how many times he'd been fooled on his own laptop, FBI laptop. And uh, so don't think you can't fall for these scams. They're, they, these, the, the days of misspelled words, broken English, those are so rare that when we see one, we pass it around just to have a laugh. You know, they, these, they're, they're perfect grammar, perfect graphics. If you're targeted, they're going to know who somebody in your company works for. And maybe the email appears to come from you. And you're asking them to do something that's going to jeopardize the entire firm. And that's 95% of breaches. And and it's it's interesting that you mentioned that, Tom, right? Because a lot of these simulated phishing attacks by IT departments, in my experience, are relatively obvious. But I think what you're getting at, right, is is something a little bit different. And we we talked about the use of AI, right, and this explosion of it, right? Chat GPT. And these companies and making these predictions about how it's going to affect everything, right? How do you see artificial intelligence affecting the cybersecurity space? 
I think it's uh, it's going to have a dramatic effect on it. I think it's going to happen a lot quicker than most people realize. We actually sent a threat advisory out last week on it, you know, telling everybody that we don't know how all this is going to shake out, but I do know this. It's going to change the game. You know, there's a difference between targeted and automated attacks, right? You know, most of our clients are not targeted. Some are, but most of them aren't. We are. We are 100% targeted. And so what that means is there's a human being or there's a criminal organization that is trying like heck each and every single day to get into our company because they know it's a lucrative environment. They're going to make a ton of money if they can break into us. With the advent of AI, they can further refine not only these psychological manipulation techniques like learning who the boss is at your organization and who they need to target and then apply their special superpowers to writing, crafting that email. With AI, they're going to scale it. So now it changed the risk profile for everyone. Even if you're a small engineering firm, you may be a victim of a finely crafted artificial intelligence system, hacking system, that is highly personalized, done at scale in that 100,000 email, phishing email send out. And you didn't really have to worry about that before, because like you said, they're easily identified. And, and I want to mention something else about the way I got fooled. I've only failed once. And, and this, is how, this is how a lack of vigilance can bring the whole thing down. I just so happened to be working on my Google security settings. And coincidentally, the phishing test came in from Google saying your security settings have changed. I mean, I was right in the middle of it. And I clicked on the link. If I had taken just a second to carefully look at it, there's a limit to what you can do with phishing sims. And it and for me, it's real easy to see. Uh, but I didn't do it because coincidentally I was working on it. The president of the company fell for one of them for the very same reason. I mm -hmm. forgot what he was working on, but it just, it was a coincidence. And we both, we both, um, lacked vigilance. You know, we didn't think about it could be a coincidence. So you, anybody can be fooled. Coincidences happen and the list goes on. And that's why we have multiple, you know, we do a defense in depth strategy. Any good security does. And so all these layers of defense that we put in place is to protect you from the inevitable human failure. And, and Tom, from what you're describing there, there maybe seems to be two kinds of paths you can take, right. As a, as a business owner, right. There's the preventative maintenance side where a firm, maybe such as your own is coming in and putting systems in place to mitigate um, risks. Then there's also the reactive approach where you know something's gone wrong, right? And you need to basically do damage control. They're related, but I'd like to talk about the first on the preventative maintenance side. And we don't necessarily need hard numbers, but could you talk about the return on investment that a firm is going to see by taking a preventative approach to cybersecurity? Well, the there's really no good data to back all of this up. I think it's real simple to say that if you've got the most, if you've got the best uh, security in place and you've never been hacked, there's no return on investment, right? You know, what's the return on investment in electricity? What's the return on investment in the insurance premiums? The list goes on and on and on. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but your security company should be able to tell you in reports over months or quarters or years how many threats were stopped and what the type of the threats are. But in but in many instances, and who the threat actors may have been and what technology they were using, there's a lot of things that go into investigating a security anomaly. And they all have to be investigated, which is kind of a difference between InfoSec and IT management. Uh, you know, IT management, well, I don't know why the server glitched, but it's not now, so we'll, we'll just stick that in the corner somewhere. We can't, we don't have the luxury of being able to do that. Uh, but the, the research does say the cost of being proactive in protection is four to five times cheaper than responding 
to an anomaly. And and because you have a security team by your side, well, then your people know that if they get something that just doesn't look right, they can pick the phone or they can forward an email and say, is this safe? You, if you don't have a team that can quickly analyze an email, you know, because you guys deal with a lot of spreadsheets, among other things. Spreadsheets are a great way to deploy uh, ransomware attacks. Uh, you know, it, it's a great way to p- help protect your team. And and sometimes it's it's malicious and sometimes it's not. But they know to, you know, the, the company understands and they've got their culture designed in such a way that if anything looks out of the ordinary, contact Iron Tech Security. You know, just let them do their thing and make sure it's all good to go. And uh, that that's what that's what smart businesses are doing these days. So then on the flip side of that, Tom, <clears throat> let's just say you, you're you a business or a firm, right? And you don't have this preventative maintenance or system in place, right? And you get hacked, breached, whatever you'd like to call it, right? What what should an AEC firm be doing in that case? It depends on the scale of the attack. If you're a large AEC firm, you know, maybe a multinational organization, uh, you may have a PR issue, so you've got to have crisis management. And the particular specialty in our industry is called incident response. These these are these teams need to be called in, and uh, and so they can negotiate a ransom. Perhaps sometimes they'll bring their own crisis PR management in place because uh, you've got issues with lack of trust, reputational loss. Depending on who your clients are, it could have all sorts of fallout from fines and and loss of revenue and you know just all sorts of things and so that's that's what a uh, ir teams do now if you're already engaged and you've got a team monitoring and responding to intrusions that are detected they're they're preventing intrusions uh they're going to do the incident response for your firm because they've got already already have the tools in place to respond. You know, the military is already there. The tanks are already on the battlefield. The planes are in the air. But if you're getting blind shot, you know, you're getting blind bombed, you know, like Pearl Harbor, you know, we couldn't respond efficiently because we didn't prepare for that attack. We didn't know. That was an intelligence failure or something. Depends on what rumor you, (laughs) whatever the latest rumor is, but... Um, but you know, if you've already got a military engaged or, I mean, a a defense engaged, there's so many military analogies. Uh, if you've already got your military engaged and they're on alert, the likelihood of you having a successful attack is nil. We've, I, I may not always be able to say this, but no client of ours has had a successful breach of any consequence. We had a really bad attack on a surgeon's office that I think a couple of insignificant files managed to get encrypted and his office did have to shut down for a day and a half and they were crippled for about a month, but they were able to get back to work. Um, it would have been much more catastrophic had we not responded to that threat immediately and begun mitigating it. So it's really critical that you don't think that I can just take care of it if it happens to me. I mean, if you really understand the sheer size, you know, if you guys, for the readers out there, uh, the security, cybersecurity reporter for the New York Times wrote a book that's titled, this is, this is how they tell me the world ends. And if you think I'm exaggerating in any way, the size and the scope of this threat is read that book because she she spent years in the industry with all the bad guys and the good guys. And there are so many things with full citations in that book that is terrifying. If anything, I'm understating the threat and the seriousness of this. And right, Tom, bringing it back to, you know, AEC analogies, right? Like with our clients, we're not asking them to be the expert right? We're going in and we're providing professional services because we are the experts in the same vein, right? 
we should take the advice we give our clients because we're AEC firms, right? We're not cybersecurity experts. So it sounds like there's there's a, at least it's at least prudent to be talking to someone like you, right? Educating yourself, which is now I want to talk about the two books you've got in your your background banner there. And for those who are on audio only, Tom's got two books on his background. One, The Cyber Pandemic, Survival Guide, and Hack the Rich. So in whatever order or way you think's best, Tom, but could you just give our listeners and viewers a sneak peek into why you wrote these books and what they're all about? Yes. So first of all, all the books that I've written and and I've got another one in the works this year, uh, these are targeted for business managers and owners and leaders of their organization. This is not a geek to geek book. Okay. And it has an entertaining fictional story in both of them and the next one that that dip, dips into the gray hat world because I knew I needed to keep their attention. You know, I can go in there and throw out the acronyms as well as anybody. Yeah, you need a SIM tool and you need an EDR and, you know, defense in depth strategy and layered approach and you got to use NIST, CSF, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it's not going to keep anyone's attention. But the Cyber Pandemic Survival Guide, I wrote that book based upon the notion of what would happen if a computer virus affected millions and millions of people, how would that compare to COVID? And instead of it taking days and weeks to spread around the world, because it takes time for human beings to go from Tokyo to San Francisco, it takes a millisecond to go from Tokyo to San Francisco on the internet. And with these nation state level cyber offensive war weapons that are out in the wild being used against us right now, each and every single day. If one of them gets out of control, it could propagate around the world in hours, maybe even minutes, and and create a true crisis that would make COVID look like a speed bump. And we are talking about loss of life. There have been cyber incidences where there were loss of human life. Russia stopped just short of killing people in Ukraine five years ago when they launched a cyber war against Ukraine. Most people missed it, but it was a huge test run of any nation state against another country with cyber weapons. The other book is meant for, for lack of a better term, high net worth individuals, the individual, so to speak. So, you know, if you don't fall on that label or whatever, uh, don't worry. It's about uh, any individual can use the the techniques and the things in this book to protect yourself. And there's many, many things that you can do. Some of it's common sense. You know, don't reuse passwords. Don't use easy to guess passwords. Get a password manager. But it is. But high net worth individuals do have a unique r- uh, risk profile. Many of you have both. Now, the first one, the cyber pandemic, talks about the five things that are international standards, exactly what you need to put in place that will change your risk profile from a 5 to 10% chance of being hacked to probably a 0.01%. You know, because there's five things that everyone knows this is what you do. You know, you got to get these in there. and But the risk analysis drives all those decisions. So either one of the books, they're very easy read, uh, you know, probably... It takes me about an hour, hour and a half to read a book of that size. So available on Amazon. Which is great because the the topic can be a little bit daunting, especially if, right, if your focus is an AEC professional, you know, you might use a computer every day, but you're by no means an expert in, you know, computers, IT, technology, cybersecurity, right? So it sounds like these are fairly easy reads meant for, not necessarily the layperson, but for somebody outside and really deeply involved in the in your industry, correct? Oh, absolutely, and it, and it is for the layperson. I mean, we uh, I went out of my way to make sure, it, and that's the great thing about using the fictional component. I could illustrate, sort of in real life, the scenario in which these management, leadership, and defensive systems failed. You know. You don't, you don't have to be an engineer to know why the Challenger space shuttle blew up, right? Oh, it was cold. Uh, the uh, O-rings got brittle. Okay, I'm, I'm not an engineer on that, on that kind of rocket engineer. 
I, I get the concept, right? So that's the, but no, that's really the audience for the books is to really in real life, illustrate how these things go wrong. And, uh, and in fact, the cyber pandemic uses a ransomware attack on a small town and, uh, the impact that it had on all the residents of the, of the town. Absolutely. So we, so Tom, today we've kind of went from, you know, wide to narrow, right? We talked about the industry in general. We talked about a little bit about your firm, what firms can do to protect themselves, what individuals can do to protect themselves, how people can educate themselves kind of on this, this topic that always doesn't get the attention it deserves. What final piece of advice would you like to give the audience today based on everything that we've talked about? Take it serious. Make that leadership, strategic, visionary decision to, at the very least, do a risk analysis. You know, a good risk analysis that follows international standards. We do those complementary for uh, people that are just interested in learning where they are. You've got to, you've got to identify your weaknesses and vulnerabilities. Acknowledge the fact that yes, you're you're going to be a victim someday. If some it's some size some way it's going to happen if you don't have the proper protection in place and then commit to it you know do the things that the vulnerability says you got to do to protect you protect your firm and then make it a culture thing you know you you want your culture to understand that productivity increases and efficiency increases and smart decisions are all well and good but security has to be job one and then get that embedded in your company. You know, there's, there's a limit to what I can do in a client's organization. And I find myself more and more saying, you know, you guys need to implement this. This is not just don't it's, it doesn't all fall on us. The reason you're paying us is because we're worried about a human failure. That's something that you can change and make your firm safer. And that, and that's the number one thing. And, 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 you know, we touched on this. Don't, don't think it won't happen to you. I, I'll bet you 30% of the people listening to this has either had a ransomware attack or knows, knows someone personally that's had one. And you know, those aren't JBS. They're not colonial pipeline or any of these other major attacks that you see on CNN and read about in the New York times. And what percentage of it? What percentage of attacks would you say go public versus the ones that just stay <laughs> hidden? It, you know, there's really no good statistics. Uh, I'd love it. Well, if it, if it never gets reported, how how do you gather stati statistics, right? Uh, th that's a great question. I, I've seen like half of them, but I think it's way, way higher. I, uh, you know, there was a local CPA firm that, that got hit. They were a former client. They wouldn't put the security stuff in place because we require certain things. They didn't want to pay the money for it. A couple of years goes by, they get hit with a ransomware attack and needed, I don't know, three or $5,000 in Bitcoin. The IT company that they had, that they used knew I had the Bitcoin. And that's the only reason I came up, I, I learned about it. And then they they acquired the accounting firm that I I was using currently, and I couldn't I couldn't stay with them as a, an accounting firm because I knew that they weren't taking security job one, so we left them. I didn't have anything personally against the firm; I, uh, they were wonderful people, but I knew that I couldn't. I did. I, I, my data is at risk. My financials are at risk. Which and the same thing it would be true for my attorneys and you know everybody I deal with. You, which is you have to think from a stakeholder perspective, not, not just you, not just your clients, but all the stakeholders in your organization. Yeah, absolutely. And, and right. Coming like straight from the horse's mouth, right. Someone who is a leader in a cybersecurity firm, but also lives day-to-day -day life just like everyone else. Right. Yeah. Well, I got a special interest in this because about seven years ago, almost eight now, the FBI came to my office and said, is Tom Kirkham here? And I said, he identified himself. And I said, yeah, that's me. And he goes, well, you're in trouble, but not with us. And he, after a few minutes of him talking, it all of a sudden dawned on me that I'm on an ISIS kill list because of a data breach. 
it wasn't because of the industry that I'm in. It was, it was, well, it was because I was in the IT industry uh, a few years earlier, but they, one of the, if you remember back seven years ago when they were doing all the kill list, you know, mostly politicians, law enforcement, military, New York city, Washington, that those kind of, there was one list that was totally appeared to be totally random and it was all over the United States and not my name, address, place of employment, phone number, all of it was on the list. And it ended up being because of a data breach. And that's what I mean when I say it can be life and death. And just something as simple as that, that's a life-changing event. It, it really drove my passion for cybersecurity. And, and hopefully, you know, to, to the listeners, right, your current clients, your future clients, there doesn't need to be that event of that magnitude to get them to take cybersecurity seriously, right? It, absolutely. Because, you know, even if you, you, let's say you get a ransomware attack or you've had one and let's say the ransom was only 3000 and you're a $10 million, a hundred million dollar engineering firm. Well, you go, whew, let's pay the three grand, get back up and running, right? No brainer, no big deal. Not even a speed bump. We're talking a pebble on the road, right? And, and people have a tendency to think, well, what's the odds that it's going to happen again? Well, there's two things. Number one, you're a mark. You paid the ransom. And maybe next time they'll see how big you are and not ask for 3000 but 30000 30, or 300000 or $3 million. But what you need to know is that that network has not been forensically examined by an information security specialist. It's got multiple payloads. There's server backdoors. There's workstation key loggers. There's other things on that network that may lay dormant for months or years before another criminal organization that specializes in exploiting server backdoors picks it up and runs with it. We've never gone into a client that's had a previous ransomware attack and not discovered those things. And that's been true for a few few years now. There's multiple payloads going on. And and this is a fascinating discussion, right? Because just as a right as a regular person, I had no idea how just how crazy it is. So if our listeners want to connect with you, right, find out more information, maybe have you do some consulting for their firm, where can they find you? IronTechSecurity.com is the it's got all of our contact information on there. Just reach out to us and you know, schedule uh, a, a 15 minute phone call and, and ask the questions and the concerns that you have. But, you know, really and truly, the good decision is to get a risk assessment done. Just see where you are, where you're vulnerable, what your weaknesses are. Many of those things you can fix yourself, but you're not going to get the inner, you can't get the enterprise grade technical controls, you know, technical defenses, nor a skilled security team. Uh, yourself, you know, that that's where firms like ours comes in there because we know what the best in class products are and we know best in press, best in class practices, you know, these administrative controls, you know, it, and a good example here is if, if you're say you've got you, everybody's got to log in on the network. And if you're practicing the old school way of ch forcing password changes every 30 days or every 90 days, there's a better way to do it that's actually not as much of a hassle. So that that kind of demonstrates the difference between, you know, the objectives of IT. And you want your IT department to concentrate on IT. That hits the bottom line positively each and every single day. And and but we but there's a more secure way that sometimes we get a win that it's actually less hassle and makes it more secure. And that and that's where the security expertise and experience comes in. So, yeah, that's old school, forcing password changes every 90 on a time schedule. The, the world works a lot faster than 50 years ago when that procedure was developed. Absolutely. Right. And then and if, and if firms are working with right someone like you, right, they're just coming to that wealth of knowledge and, and not needing to, to kind of find it themselves. But, Tom, it, it's been great. It's been educational talking to you. So. Um, I think this is going to be a great episode to to the rest of the audience. And of course, um, the offer we make at the end of every episode, right? You heard 
you know, you heard where you guys can find Tom. You can find us here at the Engineering Management Institute. You can find me personally on LinkedIn. And Tom, I'll kind of just let you close it out. Okay. Uh, well, I don't really have much else to say, but if you uh, if you want me to send you the link of the uh, the book that I mentioned or links to my books, uh, just uh, drop me a line. You can use the website to send in the form. They'll make sure it gets funneled to me. And uh, with that being said, it's been a pleasure being on here. I understand time is money. Your time is very valuable as 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 well as mine. And I really hope you learned something and it was worth your time. I I I really believe it is. Whether it's with us or someone else, you if you if you know that you're not up to snuff, please take action and find out where you are and what you need to do. Absolutely. And right. Me personally, this was great, Tom. So thank you again. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll see you next time. All right. Sounds good, Nick. Enjoyed it. Thank you, Tom. Please remember, you can find the show notes for this episode at aectechpodcast.com. There, you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, as well as links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during the episode. Until next time, I wish you the best in all of your engineering and technology endeavors. Thank you.